Chapter 16, Hong Kong. We three children were very excited when we walked up the gangway of the British flagship China Star and saw officers, crew, and staff rushing around. A Chinese steward led the way and helped Uncle Jean and Aunt Rian with our luggage. Victor, Claudine, and I lagged behind. The steward was tall and thin and towered over everyone. His head was completely bald and he walked with a pronounced limp. As we followed them down a long, narrow corridor towards our cabins, all we could see was the steward's shiny scalp bobbing up and down under the dim ceiling lights. Victor whispered to me, One thing about having no hair at all on your head, you always look neat. Though I was still feeling nervous and tongue-tied because it had only been three days since Aunt Rain took me out of St. Joseph's, I laughed out loud. That was the effect Victor had on people. He and Claudine made me feel at ease as soon as I met them. Boys to the right and girls to the left, Uncle Jean said. Our two cabins were directly opposite each other. Inside, everything was neat, bare, and clean. While Aunt Rain, Claudine, and I were unpacking, there was a knock on the door. Victor stood there, grinning from ear to ear and wearing a bright red and orange life jacket. Why are you wearing that? Claudine protested. Our ship hasn't even sailed yet. In case the China Star starts going down, then you'll really be sorry you were not wearing one yourself. Here, let me show you something. He parted the curtain and looked out of the round porthole. Our cabin was below deck. Outside, we could see nothing but deep, dark water. It did appear rather sinister and forbidding. Claudine became alarmed. Mama, how often does the ship sink? She asked. Before Aunt Rain had time to reply, Victor quipped with a straight face, only once. Aunt Rain and I could not help laughing in spite of ourselves, but then Victor did something my brothers would never have done. He took off his life jacket, slipped it on his sister, and showed her how to adjust the straps. There were only two narrow twin beds in our cabin, each covered with a dark blue bedspread tucked in tightly. At night, our steward brought in a tiny roll-out cot because there were three of us. I assumed the cot was for me. Though the mattress was thin and barely six inches from the floor, I didn't mind because it was a small price to pay for being rescued from the communists. I was arranging the blankets and pillows when Aunt Rain put a restraining hand on my arm. Now, now, remember what I told you on your first day with us. It's share and share alike in our family. Nobody is going to be treated differently. Come. Let's draw lots to decide who will sleep on the floor. She tore a sheet of paper into three parts, wrote bed one on one, bed two on the second, and cot on the third. Folded them and placed them in a paper bag from which we made our picks, including Aunt Rain herself. Claudine picked first, came up with a cot, and slept there the entire time without protest. That was how the Schilling family treated me throughout the time I spent with them. They made me feel as if I were their third child. For the first time in my life, I did not automatically get the short end of the stick, but was given an equal share, just like Victor and Claudine. As we steamed southward, the weather became noticeably warmer. The sea was calm, and we three children spent much time playing hide-and-seek on the decks. Once Victor hid in a lifeboat for half an hour while we searched everywhere. Then he suddenly jumped out as we passed below him, scaring and delighting us at the same time. I am Simbad the Sailor, he cried. Don't you love the smell of the salty sea and the noise of the engines and everything about the ship? What I love best is the library. Let's go there, I told them. The library was tucked away in a quiet, secluded corner next to a sun-drenched atrium. All the books were in English. Most of them were mysteries, romances, and travel books. We browsed for a while until Victor found a stack of games. Claudine turned out to be a whiz at Monopoly. While we played, I could not help noticing how nice Victor was to his sister. Though he liked to tease her, he was gentle and protective at the same time. For long stretches of time on that voyage, as we chased each other on deck, read books in the library, played games in the atrium, or made paper cuts from the book Mother Marie had given me, I actually felt as if I were part of the Schilling family and no longer the unwanted daughter who always came last. At night, I would fantasize about being adopted by them, belonging to them, and going off with them forever. How wonderful life would be if I did not have to face Nyang ever again. Then I would remember my true status and my heart would be touched by ice. It could be put off no longer. The dreaded day had arrived for me to come face to face with Nyang. Our ship steamed into the dock in Hong Kong Harbor. We walked down the gangplank in search of a familiar face, but no one was there to meet us. 
on train comforted me. It was so difficult to get our boat tickets, and I couldn't be sure until the very last minute. By then, it was too late to write to your parents. Two months ago, I did send them a letter to say we were definitely coming to Hong Kong soon, but didn't know the exact date. I'll go find a telephone to tell them we're here and that you're with us, Adeline. They'll be so thrilled. Victor and Claudine groaned in unison, crushed and not being met. I breathed a sigh of relief, but quickly pretended disappointment. We hailed a taxi and squeezed in with all our luggage. Aunt Rain turned to me. I forgot today was Sunday. We're lucky because when I phoned your parents, I found everyone home, including your father. I sat in the taxi in silent terror. The roads were clean and traffic was orderly. Our cab trailed a tall red double-decker bus which stopped at a traffic light. Claudine wound down the car window. How hot and stuffy Hong Kong is, she said. Look at the street signs. They're all bilingual with English on top and Chinese at the bottom, but nothing in French. Victor answered in a superior tone. Of course there is nothing in French. Everything has to be in English because we are on British soil. Hong Kong has been a British colony for over 100 years. It became British when China lost the Opium War. Look at the shop signs. They have English on them too. Having spent so much time together while sailing from Tianjin to Hong Kong, the three of us had become good friends. Victor addressed me. Let's continue our Monopoly game when we get to your parents' place. On board ship, I kept losing. Maybe my luck will change here. Will you show me how to make those paper cuts and lend me that book Mother Marie gave you called Paper Magic? What a smashing book. You think your mother will let us have some big sheets of paper so we can make fleets of airplanes and platoons of soldiers? I'll paint designs on them in two different colors and we can play war games with them. Won't that be fun? I smiled and nodded. Victor didn't know that the make-believe Nying I talked about was very different from the real one we'd be facing. All too quickly, our cab turned into a street marked Boundary Street and stopped opposite an imposing school building. Was I to be dropped off at another school so soon? A large sign above the gate read, Mary Knoll Convent School. No children were about, and the gate was closed. The cab driver asked me for his fare in Cantonese, expecting me to translate since I was the only one with a Chinese face. Aunt Rain answered in fluent Mandarin and paid him. Regarding her with new respect, he pointed to the freshly painted three-story apartment building next to us and helped with our luggage. So they live opposite a girl's school, I thought. Is little sister enrolled there? How convenient for her. Suddenly, father, Yang, fourth brother, little sister, and two maids were swarming around us. Hello, 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 welcome, welcome. Yang was embracing Aunt Rain and jabbering away gaily in a mixture of French and English. We have been watching out for you from our balcony. Come in, come in. Her greeting appeared to include me, though she neither made eye contact nor addressed me directly. Father grinned from ear to ear and warmly shook Uncle Jean's hand. Fourth brother hailed Victor, and little sister was making conversation with Claudine. In the hubbub, they had forgotten me. I felt faint at my good fortune and lingered behind with the maids, helping them with the luggage. I was the last to struggle up the stairs with my suitcase. Their apartment was on the second floor. The front door was half open, and I entered a hallway come dining room. Inside, it was dim, but I heard voices and laughter emanating from the living room. I blinked to clear my vision and put my case down tentatively pushing it close against a wall to make it as unobtrusive as possible. Someone coughed and I looked up, realizing with a start that I was not alone. My eyes adjusted to the semi-darkness and there, standing quietly at one end of the oval dining room table against a small window, was my grandfather. Yay, yay, I cried as my heart leapt with joy. I rushed across to stand by his side, knowing he had been waiting for me. Let me look at you, he said, measuring my head against his chest. My, how you have grown. I do believe you are already almost as tall as your Aunt Baba. Tell me, did you lead your class before you left Tianjin? I couldn't very well tell him about being the only student left in the entire school. Besides, I was a little shy because he sounded strange and familiar at the same time. There was something else undefinable about him which brought a lump to my throat. I looked down at my feet, unable to speak for a moment. Have you already forgotten how to talk in our Shanghai dialect, he teased. Are you able to chat in French and English now? Take off your coat. Why are you wearing it when sweat is pouring down your face? I do believe you're still dressed for the bitter Tianjin winter. What is to become of you, grown up so big and still so little? 
His voice was full of love, bringing back long, suppressed memories of home in Shanghai and Aunt Baba. I took off my coat and sweater. Underneath, I was still wearing the long sleeve white blouse and dark blue woolen skirt that were the winter uniform of St. Joseph's and the only clothes that still fitted me. We'd better go in and join your parents now, he said with a hint of reluctance, leading the way. Otherwise, they'll be wondering where you are. In the living room, everyone was crowded around a glass coffee table. They made room to include us and gave Ye Ye the seat of honor while I squatted on the floor with the other children. Aunt Rain had a pair of scissors in her right hand. She took her coat and examined the buttons one by one. As we watched Spellbound, she selected a button, cut a knot, and pulled a thread. Out emerged a sparkling diamond to glitter magnificently against the dark brown cloth of her winter jacket. Everyone gasped, and Yang laughed out loud while clapping her hands like a child. Aunt Rain repeated the process until there were eight precious stones glittering in front of us, dazzling us with the radiance and luster. My entire diamond collection, Nang exclaimed. How clever you are, Rain. Did anyone suspect? There were a few hair-raising moments, Aunt Rain replied with a smile, but let's not dwell on those in front of the children. Not only do you have your gems back, we also have rescued your daughter from communist hands. This calls for a double celebration, n'est-ce pas? The Aunt Rain was speaking of me. Neither Nyang nor father looked in my direction. So far, they had not addressed me at all. Theirs was the gaze that glances but does not see. Champagne all around, father exclaimed, grinning from ear to ear. How can we ever thank you enough? May we invite you to the Peninsula Hotel for dinner tonight? They have recently employed a new chef who is excellent. During the ensuing commotion, Ye Ye signaled me to leave the room with him. When Aunt Rain phoned this morning, and I heard of your expected arrival in Hong Kong, he said, I ordered the maids to set up a cot in my room at once. While your Nang is in this euphoric mood, quickly unpack your bag and settle in before she changes her mind about your staying there. This apartment is small, and there is little room. Thank you, Ye Ye. I picked up my suitcase and followed him to his room. There is no need to say more. He did not elaborate, and I asked no questions. We understood each other's predicament only too well. He strolled back to the living room while I started to unpack. The new quality in his voice that hadn't been there before came back to me. What was it? The correct word dawned as I closed the lid of my empty suitcase. Of course. It was defeat. Ye Ye had given up. The Schilling family stayed at a small hotel nearby. Next morning, they walked over for breakfast at 9 o'clock. Father had already left for the office, and fourth brother and little sister were at school. Nyang made plans to take her sister's family shopping and sightseeing. She invited Ye Ye to accompany them. No, thank you, Ye Ye declined politely. I am feeling a little tired today. My neck bothers me. Adeline, you can make yourself useful for once and massage Ye Ye's neck for him, Nyang ordered, looking directly at me for the first time. I was overjoyed. Not only had Nyang finally acknowledged me, she had even given me a test to perform. Perhaps she'd forgiven me. Yes, Nyang, I answered promptly. Victor groaned. Does that mean Adeline won't be coming with us? Que dommage. Before I go, Adeline, how about folding a few more paper airplanes with me? There's still time. After the departure, Ye and I settled comfortably in the airy and bright living room. Read me the newspapers, Ye Ye said. The newsprint here in Hong Kong is definitely smaller. I can hardly read the paper even with glasses. My doctor says it's due to my diabetes. Lately, I'm also having trouble hearing. My lower back aches as much as my neck. The worst thing about growing old is that the gadgets of my body are failing one by one. I started to read, but all the news was depressing. It is estimated that the loss incurred at the Battle of Huai Hai has cost the Nationalists over half a million troops. Chiang Kai-shek has definitely resigned as President of China. Vice President Li Sung-jen takes office and is trying to negotiate peace with the Communists. People's Liberation Army soldiers are marching toward Nanking and Shanghai and preparing to cross the Yangtze River in mass. Mobs intending to flee Shanghai for Hong Kong and Taiwan congregate and riot at shipping offices for tickets. One U.S. dollar is now worth 9.5 million Chinese yuan. 
I stopped often because many Chinese words were unfamiliar. You are forgetting your Chinese, Ye Ye admonished. Go get the dictionary on the table by my bed. Look up those new words I just taught you and copy them in your notebook. My mind was full of gloomy thoughts and I suddenly burst out, I'm sick and tired of blindly copying Chinese characters over and over into my notebook like a robot. I hate studying Chinese. It's a waste of time. Besides, your dictionary is not a real dictionary. It's only a Chinese Chinese dictionary, not a Chinese English dictionary. I only want to learn English, not Chinese. How can you say that? Ye Ye demanded. The hurt on his face made me cringe, but I was unable to stop. My teacher, Mother Marie, says the only way to succeed in the second half of the 20th century is to be fluent in English. Hand me a piece of paper, get me a pen, and come over here. Ye Ye said softly, let me show you something. Though you have a fine mind and a subtle in intellect, the sentiments you express not only expose your ignorance, they also wound my heart. You forget that I know you only too well. Not only what you look like outside, but also how you are made inside. How can you say you hate the study of Chinese when you are Chinese yourself? Go look in the mirror if you have any doubts. You may be right in believing that if you study hard, one day you might become fluent in English, but you will still look Chinese. And when people meet you, they'll see a Chinese girl no matter how well you speak English. You'll always be expected to know Chinese, and if you don't, I'm afraid they will not respect you as much. Besides, China is a huge country with a vast population and an ancient culture. Though life has to be lived forward, it can only be understood backward. Reading Chinese history will enlighten you in ways no English writing can. I predict that in a hundred years from now, the world's many languages will be distilled down to three, Chinese, English, and Spanish. Chinese will never disappear because China's population has a unified written language. Above all, there is the wisdom and magic of our language itself. When you read a Chinese book, try to look at the characters and think about them. I have met many who appear to know a good many Chinese words, but never actually grasp the true meaning of any of them. Let me give you the example of just one character, Bei, to illustrate my point. In ancient times, cowrie shells were used as units of money and were exchanged for goods and services. In time, a hole was drilled in those shells and a row of shells was held together by a string. A string of shells was called Bei. Look at the character, Bei, carefully. Does it not resemble a row of shells held tightly by a piece of string knotted at the end? I agree that Chinese words are more difficult to learn than English. We do not have an alphabet, and there's no correlation at all between our written and spoken language. In fact, I once met a Frenchman who could not speak a word of Chinese, but wrote and read Chinese so well, he worked as a translator of Chinese law at the French consulate in Shanghai. Chinese is a pictorial language, not a phonetic one. Our words come from images. The meaning of many characters is subtle and profound. Other words are poetic and even philosophical. To go back to Bei, because the word evolved from something that was valuable in ancient times, many modern Chinese words containing the component Bei are associated with finance or commerce in some way. Take the word Mei. It means to buy. Mei means to sell. Place the two words side by side, Mei, Mei, buy, sell, and the term means business. Now, what is the essence of business if not buy, sell? Regardless of what commodity you are trading, if you wish to be successful in business, you hope to buy low and sell high. Otherwise, you are in big trouble. This is universally true regardless of what business you're in. Look at me, me again. The words look almost the same but are pronounced a bit differently. What is the only difference between the two characters compared to me, buy, the word me, sell, has the symbol two on top. What is two? The word two means earth or land. If the essence of business is buy, sell, then its most important ingredient is two, earth or land. Should you go into business one day, keep this in mind. Everything else can be made better or cheaper or faster, but not land. It is the only commodity that can never be duplicated or replaced. Now look at two other words that also contain bay. They appear very similar. At first glance, if you are careless, you might even mistake them for each other. Pin and tan. But you have to be very, very careful. Don't ever mix them up just because they resemble each other. Pin means poverty. 
Tan means greed. Remember how much the two words look alike. Yes, greed and poverty are intimately linked in mysterious ways indeed. All covet, all lose. You have the newspaper in front of you. Pick another word, for instance, ye. Look at it. The top part, yin, is sound. The bottom part, zin, is heart. Does this not look like a jumping heart? Put yin on top of zin and you have yi, which means sound from your heart. The new word, yi, is a symbol for intention or meaning. What is intention but a sound from your heart? How about a new word, a difficult word, jian? On top is a symbol for grass or straw or vegetable matter. Below is a little house with a partition at the middle. On the left of the wall is a symbol for small. On the right is chong, a symbol for worm. So here we have a little house made of vegetable matter with a little worm in it. What is the word, John? Cocoon. Look at it again. Now close your eyes. Do you see a little straw hut with a small worm inside? Then you can have two or more words that combined together are transformed into something wonderful and illuminating. For instance, way means danger. Xi means opportunity. Add them together and you have a crisis. Break them apart and keep in mind that whenever you are in a crisis, you're in the midst of danger as well as opportunity. Now, do you still think the study of Chinese is boring? For a whole week, Ning went out with the shillings. She always invited Ye Ye, but never included me. Everyone knew she didn't really want Ye Ye to accompany them and only asked him out of politeness. He invariably thanked her and said he preferred to rest at home. Did I mind being left behind with my grandfather? Of course not. As soon as Yang left, it was as if a heavy weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Aside from Ye Ye, me and the maids, even the apartment itself seemed to breathe a sigh of deliverance. At once, the whole place became brighter, cozier, and friendlier. To the two of us sitting side by side, playing Chinese chess or reading the newspaper, the house would gradually transform itself into a happier and more intimate place. A week went by, and it was Sunday again. The sun was shining, everyone was home, and excitement was in the air. At breakfast, Niang announced, Today we will go for a long scenic drive and visit the elegant Repulse Bay Hotel on the far side of Hong Kong Island. I've made lunch reservations at the hotel's dining room, where the view is breathtaking and the food delicious. Our car will travel from Kowloon to Hong Kong across the harbor on, by ferry. After lunch, we'll go for a swim at the beach, rent a tent, and have an afternoon picnic. Won't that be fun? She made it sound so enticing that for once, even Ye Ye agreed to go. I wondered if I was going to be included in this special outing. Yang had not said I couldn't go, nor had she said I could. One by one, they piled into Father's large Studebaker while the maids stocked the car trunk with picnic campers, lotions, blankets, and towels. Father, Ye Ye, and Uncle Jean, Jean sat in the front. Yang, Aunt Rien, Claudine, fourth brother, and little sister were in the back. Victor and I stood hesitantly next to each other. The car sagged under the weight of its many passengers. Come on, Victor, Nyang cried out gaily in French. Room for just one more, I think. We can all squeeze in just a little tighter. Victor was half in and half out of the car. He turned around and saw me watching him from the curb. It's not fair, Maman. What about Adeline? He asked Aunt Rain in French. Since Ye is coming with us, she'll be home by herself. Why don't we take her along? Not understanding French and impatient to depart, Father asked Victor in English, What is it, Victor? Do you want to use the bathroom before we start? Victor shook his head. No, Uncle Joseph, he began in English, but Nyang interrupted him in French. There's not enough room. You can see how crowded we all are. Then what about yesterday and the day before and the day before that, Victor persisted. Stop dawdling and get in the car, Aunt Rain commanded. Everyone is ready to go and you are delaying everything. It's so unfair, Victor continued. Why doesn't she get to go anywhere with us? That's just the way it is, Nyang exclaimed sharply. You either get in now and come with us, or you can stay home with her. Suit yourself. In that case, Victor replied gallantly, I think I'll stay and keep Adeline company. He climbed out to stand by my side. Together we watched the car drive off. I was overwhelmed by his chivalry, but could find no words sufficient to express my gratitude. After a painful pause, I ran upstairs, dug out my book, Paper Magic, gave it to him and said, this is for you. 
He took the book hesitantly, too stunned to say a word, unable to believe his good luck.